when, when you're a, a mind-body therapist, when you're really working holistically, when the person comes in, you're thinking this is a whole person. They have a mind, they have a body, and they have a spirit. And therefore, they may come with something that's a pain in their body. So if we're looking at the body, they come in, they've got this ease, they've got a pain in the body, they've got energy blocked in some way. So that's their body. But when you listen to the story that they tell, you might find that they have emotional issues going on, or low self-esteem, or problems with communication. So there you're listening to the mind story and how that might be affecting the body. And on a spiritual level, people that are really searching for the meaning in life, they've kind of got all the material things that they want, but they're still not happy, they're still not satisfied with life, and they they're wanting more, they know that there's more to life than that. So by linking those three areas together, you're working holistically with the person. No matter how they present, other people might present with a problem that they're saying, hey, you know, I'm really unhappy in my relationship, but it's manifesting in the body. So you work both ways, both body, mind, and meditation for the spiritual aspect and starting to have a philosophy of life is what's important. Yeah, so that's really what a holistic practitioner does. They have a number of techniques that they've learned and they use whatever's appropriate for that person. Yeah, I use quite a, a mixture of massage. I use the bone technique. I also use trigger point therapy where you actually press on an area that's painful and that sends a reflex back to the nervous system and that says, hey, let go, you're tight. And I use the Swedish massage techniques. I, um, I tend to incorporate both energetic techniques and physical techniques. I never work just physically. So those are the main ones that I do. I've done sports massage and I've done some shayatsu. So everything that I do, I really incorporate into whatever's needed. A bit like tailoring a suit for a person that comes in. You don't just get one off the rack. It's actually tailored to their needs. Polarity therapy was um, founded by a man called Dr. Randolph Stone. And he wrote his first book in 1948, and he lived in the United States. And he had a background in chiropractic, osteopathy, and naturopathy. But he knew that there was more, more than working physically. So he spent about nine years traveling the world, mainly in India, and put together a whole system based on the concept that we are more than matter, we are energy, and that we are basically love and light infused like in a crystallized form, so that as the energy steps down, it becomes more and more physical. So his whole therapies are really very holistic because he said that, well, first of all, we have our thoughts and attitudes, that we must be aware of how we think so we are. So positive thoughts and attitudes were very, very important. So for people to be aware of thinking. Secondly, you realize that all pain in the body was an energy block. And so he looked at the principles of the five elements, which are ether, air, fire, water, and earth, and the chakra system in the body. And he realized that we also have flow patterns in the body, so there are vertical flow patterns, horizontal flow patterns, surface lateral currents, diagonal flow patterns, and spirals within the body. And he used hand manipulation to work with those energies as if the body was a magnet. So if you can see the body as a magnet, the top of the body is the positive and the bottom of the body is the negative. And he worked that the right hand is positive and the left hand is negative. So by placing both hands, a bipolar contact, on parts of the body related to the energy, then you're able to remove the energy blocks and get the energy to flow freely. So his manipulations of energy through the body were one of the ways that he worked. Another way was he, he wanted people to eat healthily because he realized that we are what we eat. And so fresh, healthy food is very important. And in the Ayurvedic principles, you're able to look at food again in the element form. So you've got foods that are very airy, foods that are very 
fiery, foods that are very watery, and foods that are very earthy. So you may need to balance your diet in terms of the foods that you eat. And the other thing is, he liked people to take responsibility for doing something for themselves as well. And he suggested exercises which stretched the body, and he used sounds with these exercises. So a lot of them are based on the squat position, because the most negative part of the body is the perineal muscle. And so if you release the most negatives, then the energy will flow. So when we do the squat positions, they're always moving and dynamic. And you use sounds because sound is a vibration. So sound will actually uh, affect our body in a really dynamic way. Mm. So that's really where polarity therapies are, a very holistic approach. And I use a lot of polarity therapy when I see people because it's so profound that it balances within. And people come back and say, well, my life is more in balance on the outside, because they're more in balance on the inside. Now with polarity therapy, even though the hands go on the body, so for example, you've got a bipolar contact. I can use a finger and a thumb for a bipolar contact. I might have a problem in this joint, which this, all joints in the body are of an ether element, which is a neutral. So therefore I can contact positives and negatives on negative and positive, positive, negative and neutral with that. So I can cause an energy to flow between my fingers, which will actually go across that joint. And that energy will shift the energy that's already there that's blocked. Now, if I was working, say, on my head, I wanted to go the energy across the head, I could actually hold the head and the energy would flow from one side of the head to the other. So that would be a lateral surface current I'm working with right now. And the front of the body is sensory and the back's motor. So if I wanted to balance the motor and the sensory, I'd put one hand on the front and one hand on the back. And the energy always travels from the right hand to the left hand. So if there was more blockage, say I had a headache at the front of my head, I'd place my hands this way. But if the block was in it, a pain at the back of my head, I'd place my hands this way. So that's just in a simple way that we cause a circuit to, to go between our hands. And that will go through the person. Because all our cells, if you think about the cell, when a cell splits, it splits because there's a magnetic pull to split the cell. So we know at the cellular level that there's a magnet. And so on, as the body as a whole... There is a magnet. So you use manipulations. There, there are three ways of working with your hands. One of them is you can just hold the area very softly, and that's called a sattvic touch. And it's very airy, and it's very ethereal, and it's very relaxing. Another way is a rajasic-type movement, which is very jiggly or rocking or shaking, and that will cause fire, more fire in the body. It will actually move water and it will cause fire because you're actually shaking things. And then with a tamasic touch, which they usually use a pressure for that. So I might get the thumb and go deeply into the area. So the feet are a good place to do a tamasic touch because that's the most negative energy. So you're really shifting at a very deep level. But generally, most people will use the sattvic touch and the rajasic touch because it generally will move the energy. And the mind frame for a polarity therapist is just one of really being there for the person, just sending love. And that's a really important aspect of polarity therapy, that the person comes along and feels the love aspect. Right. Because yeah. as Randolph Stone says, we're here manifesting love. And when we feel love, we're reminded mm. that we are love. Yeah. And that's very, very important. Yeah, now NLP started back in 1972 and the co-founders were behavioural modelist John Grinder and Richard Bandler. And they wanted to know how people did what they did and how did people think. So they started off by modelling three people. Virginia Satir, who was a um, family therapist, Milton Erickson, who was a hypnotherapist, and Fritz Perls, who was a gestalt therapist. 
Now, from that time, they've modelled lots and lots of people in all kinds of areas of life. But that was the very beginning. And what they found was that we have both verbal and nonverbal behaviour. And some of the verbal behaviour is that we have the content, we say what we're saying. But along with that goes a rhythm and a tempo, and we use certain predicates. And the predicates are verbs, adverbs, and nouns. And if you listen to the predicates, they actually tell you whether a person is making pictures, is talking to themselves, or is getting a feeling for what goes on. So take, for example, someone who says, I grasp your meaning, will be a kinesthetic. That's a feeling person, because they're using the word grasp to hold. A visual person would say, I see what you mean, or I get the picture. And an auditory person would say, I hear what you say. So by understanding that, they understood the difference with people. Because if two people are communicating in different systems, they're called systems, representational systems, then they're not going to match. So they won't be totally understood. Because if I'm trying to teach someone who learns visually, and I'm getting them to do it, then they're not going to learn it. But if I can give them a picture of what to do, then they will learn it because they represent visually. So it's very important. And they found that when people are accessing these systems, their eyes move in different directions. So a visual person will look up to either side or straight forward defocused. An auditory uh, representation would go over to either side and a kinesthetic would go down to one side. And one side is remembered and one side is construct. And uh, so it's, it's not always clear that because there is a model of the world. We say that this is the model, but you always need to gather the information from people as to whether they're constructing or whether they're remembering. So we always gather that information. Now, another aspect was they looked at breathing patterns. And people that breathe in the high chest would be visually orientated. When they breathed in the mid-chest, they'd be accessing auditory. And low would be kinesthetic. So this is where the tone came in, because a low tone that's slow would go with the kinesthetic. And an auditory would just be mid-range and talking like this. And a visual would be much faster and higher and talking like this and making lots of pictures. So it was a really interesting time for them. Now, once they gathered this information, they thought, well, how is it going to be useful? And one of the most useful aspects is that you can get rapport with people very quickly. And you do that by matching them, by mirroring them, so you sit like they do. Then the next thing is to use the predicates that they use, so you're using the same system, the same tone, the same tempo. And then you're looking at beliefs and values, like find out their beliefs and values so that you can talk within their frame of reference. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. And what they found was that even though we live in this world, we take information in and it goes through filters. And those filters are beliefs, our values, and our representational systems. There are other filters as well, but they're the main ones. And then we store that information, and it gives us a model of the world. And we make new beliefs and values about the world. And then we act as if that is the truth. And that's where we work with subjective reality. And you'll find that most times when you're counseling people, their problem is to do with their subjective reality, not what really goes on. Because... If you can get them to change their thinking or to change their beliefs or to reevaluate life, then it makes changes for them, even though the same things are going on the outside. So NLP gives us way to, first of all, get rapport. Then secondly, it gives us strategies for gathering information and challenging limiting beliefs. We then have other ways that we can change our history. So if we've had trauma in the past, we can go back and resolve it. We can change beliefs. There's a whole strategy for belief changing. We can even change our behaviours, and we do all this at the unconscious level. That's what's exciting about NLP, because everything is at the unconscious level. 
See, I can't change anything much consciously because I'm always in a struggle. But if I make the changes at the unconscious level, then they will maintain that change. And so NLP has, has just been evolving ever since that time, and it continues to evolve because people are learning more and more about communication. And it, they go for what makes somebody good at what they do, what makes a good speller, what makes a good learner, what makes a good athlete, and then they teach it to other people. Now, Timeline Therapy, um, the founder of that is Tad James, and he came across that. He was an NLP master trainer, well, he still is. And he came across Timeline, the, the concept of Timeline, when he was working with a, a client. And it turned out that he realized that she had a, a memory storage, which was like a linear line. And he thought, oh, that's interesting. So he started to ask more people about their memory storage of time. And it seems that most people do have this timeline. Now, if you can think about it, it's just like a line that might go from the back of your head. So people will say, I put the past behind me. And it might go out through the front of your head and they can see where they're going. So that's a line that goes through the head. Now, another timeline might go from right to left or left to right. So one side is the past and one side is the future. Now, they're just two basic timelines, but you can have any amount of timelines, swirling timelines, timelines that go from the top to the bottom. And it's just what your unconscious mind has decided to make in terms of a timeline. And the usefulness of timeline is it's very good for eliciting a personal history. And this personal history can not only go back through our life, but it could go back on the genealogy, so it could go back the memory that was passed on from the genes from all our ancestors, or it could go into a past life. And so when we've got all that history, we can use the timeline for a number of things. One of them is that we can actually rise above time, which dissociates us from feelings, and go back to the very beginning of when we had that feeling and release the feeling from our body because it's been stored there for some reason. And we get the learning because most feelings come up to let us know that there was a learning. So we can actually use our timeline to release all the emotions from our body we can use the timeline to go back and re-decide. So take, for example, I've got a really limiting belief. Like I believe that it's not okay for me to have a lot of money. And I find out that that belief goes back to my mother's mother. And so I can go back and I can re-decide. The point she decided it's not okay to have a lot of money, because like people might not like me if I have a lot of money. It's like I can go back and I can say, it is okay to have a lot of money because people will like me anyway if I'm a likable person. The money really won't make any difference. And then once I've changed that belief back then, that will change my belief now. So that's belief changes made on redeciding. The other thing is we can actually go back and change our personal history. So if I've had a trauma, for example, I might have been abused by someone I can actually go back there and either help myself as going back as someone else or I can choose to say what it was like and empower myself again because a lot of people lose power when they are children because they really can't say and do what they wanted to do. So by going back there and creating that you do, then you own your power again and you bring that power source with you back to now. And then the other concept, of course, with timeline is because we have a future, we can actually install in our future timeline, not just by creative visualization, but by energizing it with some breathing and actually placing it in our timeline so that when that time comes to now, because we're always moving out of the now and into the future, we've actually put in there what we want to happen. And that allows us to do whatever we need to do to get that to happen. That's really important. It, it gives you a motivation and it gives you guidelines in how to take action because you know what you want. You see, a lot of people don't know what they want. They know what they don't want, but they don't know what they do want. So 
You take responsibility for knowing what you want, for getting it, and instead of being the effect of your life, you become the cause. And that's very, very powerful and energizing. So what I want you to do is I want you to just go inside and ask your unconscious mind to use this time. I started off by just making a connection with the person by just taking hold of their head. That's a great connection to start off with. And I was cradling the head. It's called a head cradle. And it really allows the energies to, to balance the length of the body and side to side. So you're just holding that and waiting for the pulses. You feel the pulses in your fingers and when you get that, then it's time to move on. Where I needed to move on was just a different area of the head. So I just moved to a different area of the head. From there, it felt like there needed to be a connection between the heart and the forehead because we've done a lot of breathing. So I actually put my right hand on the heart and my left hand on the third eye to, to get the energy to move between. I also did a lot of rocking on the shoulders because it felt like it needed movement in the body. So a rajasic type movement. I've been doing sattvic and now I was changing to rajasic to just get the movement in the body. And then as always you just hold those areas in a sattvic way and again I'm waiting for the connection to come together so I know that I can move. You also notice that I got um, her to breathe out with a sound which was very important because she was needing to really use her lungs and really use the breath. So the sound will help at that level. Then I moved on to the five-pointed star which was holding the hip to the shoulder. And this five-pointed star helps to release that five-pointed star energy through the body. Even though you're only holding two points, it's actually working on the five-pointed star level. And I did that both sides. Then I used the arm to release the arm. I actually worked on each element through holding each finger and thumb. So when I work with the thumb, I'm working with the ether. And you just using the other hand to release the energies through the arm. The next finger, the index finger, is the air, the middle finger is the fire, the next finger is the water, the next finger is the earth. And you're feeling to find if there's any blocks in those elements as I'm working with them. Then I just did some movement with the arm because I needed to link that with the shoulder. Next I used the reflex of the elbow to the stomach area on that side because it also re releases the diaphragm and we know that the diaphragm needed to be released so that because of the breathing pattern. Then we started to go down the body, so I was holding the um, earth element by working with the bowel and with the knee, because there's a triad, the bowel, the knee and the neck in astrological signs. So I was just holding the bowel to the knee to just get the energy moving. Then we moved to the top of the head and did a little bit more there. Then I went down to the feet and I released the hips again by working the ankles and then I released the thoracic area and the hips when I did the pull and we released the elements again through the toes just as we had done through the arms, we released that and um, eventually the energy just flows through so I was holding the toes to actually balance all the elements with the long currents of the body. Then it was time to um, go back to Carol and ask her to really get back in her body just in case she'd gone off somewhere because if you remember at one point I'd asked her to do some release work uh, with the timeline so to make sure that she was really back I asked her to breathe into her body and to be aware. Next I needed to work with the back area and I did that with massage so I started off by first of all just pulsing the body, getting some movement into the body, getting the energies flowing along the whole length of the back, the meridians, the motor area. And then th there was some tightness in the um, shoulder area, so I, I reflexed the shoulder to the back of the leg using polarity and just holding that. Later you'll have noticed that I also did a stretch from the shoulder to the gluteals because the shoulders and the gluteals are also related. 
Once I'd done that, then I was able to release a bit more energy by friction with the neck and the head and some more points on the head using polarity. And then I put the oil on and did an effleurage. I used Swedish massage techniques to just effleurage the body and then knead the body. And basically getting a feel for the flow and the pattern of the body, a lot of stripping movement to really get it to let go and to move whatever was in the tissue outwards to get it back into the system and to get the circulation going. So when I did the long friction on either side of the spine, that was getting the energy there, it was getting heat there, it was bringing the nerve supply to that area. Some of the areas were rather tight, so you saw me using my thumb and using trigger point therapy, which works with a reflex arc back to the area to say, hey, let go, you've gone tight. So those are the trigger points. And at some points I was doing some friction around the shoulders and again up the neck and the skull because the energy tends to rise, you have to keep clearing it. And I did some rolling movements that you'll have noticed over the shoulder which helped to really release the fascial system because you can feel when there are blocks, when there is adhesion sticking there. And there was quite a few over the shoulders that I needed to work with more specifically. Eventually we got to a point where I'd really done as much as I could in the session, so I finished the um, movements by doing the brushing off the meridians, so the gallbladder meridian that goes through the shoulders and down the sides of the leg, the bladder meridian that goes the top of the head down the middle of the back, and then because I felt it needed a little bit more in the shoulders, I finished off by just using some Bowen technique to just release the areas in the shoulders. And so I asked her to lay there while that took effect. And then it's really important um, that she um, just keep moving, not sit for too long for the rest of the day and uh, drink plenty of water so that all that energy work can continue to happen. There's really not much you can do wrong in polarity therapy. It's so unobtrusive and it's so unintrusive that you're really not going to do yourself any harm doing polarity therapy none whatsoever. I've never come across anyone who has ever harmed themselves doing polarity therapy. When it comes to timeline therapy, if they got the timeline therapy book and the basis of personality by Tad James, he states at the beginning of that book that this stuff can really change your personality. So there they have to be careful because if they want to be totally different, they might not be able to handle being totally different. It might bring things up for them that they had been, you know, suppressing or repressing. So you have to be a little bit careful there in terms of if you try to make too many changes at once, it might be difficult to deal with it and for people around you to deal with it. So with timeline, uh, I think it's pretty important to first of all learn how to do it with a practitioner because there's little things that come up that you might, you might say, oh, this doesn't work. But it's really because in the book, it doesn't tell you about the things that you might need to do to make it work, because it works at the unconscious level. So for timeline therapy, I really recommend people actually go and learn how to do timeline therapy. And they can either do that with a therapist, or, like I say, within a group, or doing a, a secretive creating your workshop. Um, workshop which they they want to hear that Tad runs and that's a really good way to, to learn how to do it because you're in an environment where you're supported. Yeah so in terms of, of massage then there are always contraindications for massage and special precautions and therefore I'd really recommend that people do go and again be taught massage rather than trying to just learn it from a book because that person who's teaching you has a wealth of information and your questions can be answered. A book cannot answer questions. So just the special precautions, I think they're, they're things like if you've got some kind of a disease like kidney disease or liver problems, heart problems, circulation problems, lymphatic problems, cancer, um, even things like nerve problems in the body, you just have to be careful how you massage. For example, if you've got a, a vein problem, you wouldn't massage over that vein because you might um, remove some blocks that are in the, brain, uh, in the vein. 
Or take, for example, uh, if you've got varicose veins, then again you'd stay awake because there's probably some inflammation. And the direction in which you massage, if you're doing any deep massage in the limbs, then you really should massage towards the heart because the valves in the veins need to have the blood push towards the heart rather than push back against the veins. If someone's got, say for example, a, a liver problem, then you're looking at the body detoxifies in the liver. So it's pretty important that you don't do too much because if the liver has to deal with the stuff you're breaking down, then that's a problem. If kidneys, you know, you might work on the body and it needs to release stuff again through the kidneys. And if you've got a kidney problem, it could be just a little bit much. So if anybody has any of those kind of problems, always just get them to check out perhaps with their doctor that it's okay and just do a little at a time. But definitely, if the person's healthy, then you're really not going to go and do a great deal as long as you work within their pain threshold. So always work within the limitations of pain. If it hurts, the rule is don't do it. Yeah, NLP is um, a very powerful tool in that sometimes you can actually use it in a, a covert way that leaves the person feeling bad afterwards. Say, for example, a person is using it in sales. They actually get rapport with the person. They find out what systems the person works in, what, how they make decisions, how they're motivated. They work with all that to sell the goods. And they've used NLP to sell the good, but the person didn't really want that. And it's not until afterwards that the person knows that they didn't want it. So a guideline for NLP is always be ecological. Always go for what the person wants that you're working with, whether it be selling or whether it will be helping them. You don't decide for them what you're going to help them do. You ask them what they want, and then you ask them, well, what? you need to do so that you can do this and then whatever they say you help them accomplish that so the guidelines with NLP is really um, you've got a great tool there and as any great tool you know I can use a screwdriver for you know undoing a screw but I can also use it for stabbing someone in the back so it's not the tool that's the problem it's how you use it so I would really encourage anyone who uses NLP to use it with heart, yes, to really think about what they're doing when they're doing it. Well, I, I think that most medical practitioners are now really realizing that mind-body therapy is useful. A lot of them are learning NLP, timeline therapy, hypnosis, um, even polarity therapy and massage. And they're starting to send people for massage. They're starting to be aware that, that counselling is a skill that they need to send them to someone else, not just a psychiatrist, but, but to a counsellor. So I, I really think that, on the whole, um, the medical profession is starting to really be aware that we are linked body, mind and spirit. Even things like, you know, transcendental meditation, a lot of medical doctors get into that and especially the doctors that are interested in the East and the West. Um, I mean, Deepak Chopra is a well-known doctor over in, you know, America and he comes from both schools and I think it's people like that that are really great for the profession because doctors can relate to him, the medical profession can relate to him. Brew Joy is another doctor who went into the you know, metaphysical side of things. So the more medical people, I mean, I suppose myself, I came from a medical background. I came from general and psychiatric nursing. And it's like once you start to see how these things help, you can't help but incorporate them. And there's always a place for surgery. There's always a place for medication. I mean, this is what's good. We have everything. And everything has its place. Right, well, the benefit is that you can continue your journey with, with one person for a while. That if something comes up that's an emotional issue, that person will be able to help you 
instead of sending them off to a, a counsellor because you can do the counselling. And just as in the counselling, if you're aware that, hey, the body really needs some work doing on it because it's got a lot of guarding there and it needs some really redefining, then you don't have to send them to another therapist for that. You can actually do that. And with the spiritual aspect, you can help that person to be spiritually aware. So with your own personal growth, like as I've grown personally, you actually help the people that come to you to grow in a, in a, a personal way. Like it's, it's a growth process, it's the journey that we're going on. And you help that person along the way, but you can actually use all areas. Where if you only do massage, then you might need to send a person to a counsellor. So the person then has to get used to that counsellor before they can work with that problem. But this way, it's, it's a journey that you go on together. Mm. Yeah. I think most things are going energetic. I mean, even tests that are done on the body are becoming more energy tests. The way that they test things are energetic. So to me, I think the mind and dealing with the emotions and dealing with the energy, really moving towards what's causing the problem. So instead of treating the effect, the symptom, actually getting to that root cause of all problems in life. And it be body, it be the mind, or it be the spirit, just whatever it needs. I think that's where it's heading. And people taking responsibility for their own health. So prevention, better than cure, I think prevention. And I was reading an article the other day where they're actually getting kids to do things in school to do with taking responsibility and meditation and relaxation. And I think that's wonderful.